We are returning today to State College, Pennsylvania to continue our interview that you don't want to miss. Stay tuned. I'll be right back. Finding and knowing God is a faith walk. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Our hope lies in the coming Messiah who will establish God's peaceful kingdom on earth. This is Faith Walk with Ron Susek. Dr. Ron is an evangelist committed to encourage and equip your faith walk as we pass through these turbulent end time days awaiting that soon coming kingdom. Here again is Ron Susek. It is so good to have you with us today on Faith Walk, a privilege and an honor because today is a special day. This is the second program that we're doing with Stacy Watkins, who was adopted into our family tree many years ago. We won't talk about that, I know, but now you're uh, one husband and five children later. Yep. And Stacy and I have not seen each other in years, but I'll never forget the... Uh, the tremendous little girl that she was when she came into the family, uh, a fiery personality, and just lit up the family, and everybody fell in love with her. And uh, now today, God is blessing her and using her in marvelous ways, and it's so good to see you again. Good to see you, too. After all these years. Yeah. You long. ought to start looking older like the rest of us. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm telling you right now, you must have been married when you were 12 or 13 mm -hmm. to have all this family, and you're so young yet. It's fabulous. <laughs> But we were talking in the previous program about adoption, but this is what's very important. Not merely human adoption, that's important, but also she is showing us how that parallels our spiritual adoption. Now, let me set the stage in case you didn't see the previous program. Understand this. Every single one of us was born into the kingdom of darkness. We didn't have a choice about that. Jesus said to people, you are of your father, the devil. When Adam sinned, he handed the authority of the human race to Satan. He didn't realize he did that, but he did. And we are born in that condition. God sent his son to earth to buy you and me out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light by the shedding of his blood. Is that making sense to you? Please understand it's that serious. Our sin is that serious that it required the death of Jesus Christ to shed his blood to pay for your sin and mine, and thereby, think about this, you pass from under the authority of Satan to the authority of God. You pass from under a tyrant mm. to a malevolent, all loving God who is working every second of every day for your best interest. We'll talk about some of that today. Stacy. good to have you with us today. Just begin to share. So an identity is very important because in the scripture, it it's talks about when Jesus was tempted by Satan and Satan said, if you be the son of God, he was questioning his identity. Jesus never responded to that because he knew exactly who he was. That would be the same if somebody said, hey, well, if you're Jim Klein's daughter, I wouldn't even respond to that because I knew who I was. I knew I was Jim Klein's daughter. I was never treated any differently than my sister. I was always Jim Klein's daughter. And I was a daddy's girl through and through. I spent so much time with my dad. And because of that, I got a lot of the same attributes as my dad. And um, one of them is I can be very stubborn at times. And I would hear that from the family. They're like, oh, my mom, you know, she's like, you're just like your dad. You're stubborn like your dad. And, but it wasn't, obviously, it was not a genetic trait. It was because of the time that I spent with him. And it's the same with that new identity that God and that relationship if we go back to the definition of adoption is to take by choice into a relationship. It's the relationship that we have with our Father, that we take on those attributes then of Christ. It's not because of like the efforts and what you do and how much you pray and how much you do this or if you've done this or you haven't done something. It's that relationship. And 
if you're secure in that love, like I was with my dad and my mom, I was very secure in how much they loved me. So I wanted to spend time. And God wants that for us. He wants to show us the identity that he has for us. I, I want you to hammer that. And, and here's why. Think about this. I can tell you exactly what God is doing in your life every second of every day. Every second. I can tell you the number one thing God is doing is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Now, many people have memorized verse 28. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. Don't use that verse out of context, because sometimes the baby dies, sometimes you don't get your job, sometimes you lose your health. So let's not say that all things work together for good. Automatically, life is magic. No. The answer to that is in the next verse, and that's the verse that no one memorizes. God predestined us to become like the image of his son, Jesus Christ. You entered your adopted family, and you're describing that you were becoming like your dad. Stubborn. <laughs> I, I never knew that part of him. By the way, what, what few people know is that her dad literally launched our ministry uh, some 50 years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, we have never forgotten the extreme importance of his calling. But when you entered that family, you focused on your dad, and everything in you wanted to be like him. You were hammering nails like him. You were doing everything like dad. My friend, you and I don't walk into heaven until we are in the total identity of Jesus Christ, when we become like him. So, whether you're going through great pain and suffering that's confusing, whether you're on a high roll of a great time of blessing, everything you're going through in life is being orchestrated by God in order to shape you into the likeness of Christ, as inadvertently, Stacy was being shaped into the likeness of her dad. Why? She loved him. She wanted to become like him. If you love God, Everything in you doesn't argue with him, doesn't try to rewrite the script, doesn't give him your ideas of how you want life to go. Everything in you is saying, God, make me like your son, Jesus. That you're adopted into that family to become like that family. All right, now I'm done with my little sermon. You carry on. So when you were talking about that, I, had, I worked at a bank in a neighboring town, and uh, I had a gentleman that came in one day, and it was shortly after I had been married. So my name plate said Stacy Watkins, and he walked up and we started talking and uh, conversing about his uh, accounts or what he wanted to do. He looked at me, he said, you have to be Jim Klein's daughter. And there's no way that he could have known that other than the fact, you know, like I said, I spent so much time with my dad, you know, and it's so important, you know, to learn our identity. And, you know, yes, we will go through trials and tribulations. Um, the scripture says that we will. But we are considered all joy, you know, because we know that God is with us in knowing that he will take care of us, whatever we're going through. The scripture also says he will never leave us or forsake us. So he is with us always, and he wants to share his heart with us. He wants to share with you what he sees you as, not what the world has labeled you as or what you have labeled yourself as. It's the way that he sees you. Think about that, Stacey, Stacey, as you see what people are doing to try to have identity. Uh, I, I, I don't want to get, get into the weeds on this, but I watch the way it, the people, we do to our bodies mm -hmm. what we want to project as an image of who I am. And there are people who want to uh, use their bodies to, to project fear to people. Others want to project sensuality. And, and every time you see that, what you're really looking at is someone lost in the weeds of identity. Where, who am I? What am I? And really, that cannot be answered by this world, not in a satisfactory way. The only way that a person can really have a, a, a sense of wholeness and completion, this is who I am, is in Christ. I'm doing a lot of work with the Assyrian people now. 
and uh, wrote a book about, called The Assyrian Prophecy. And a young lady contacted me, and she was, um, she said, by the way, I'm not talking about Syrians, I'm talking about the Assyrians that are in the Bible. I'm, I'm clarifying that because most people think, Assyrian? He must mean Syrian. No, Assyrian, the people in the Bible, well, they don't have a, they, they're a nation, but they don't have land anymore. They're scattered around the world. And uh, yet they are people of a prophecy. They're going to be home someday, I think, sooner than what people expect. But this young lady contacted me out of California. And she, she had read the book. And she said, I kept running downstairs saying, Mom, is this true? Is this true? Is this true? And mo her mother, who was raised in Iraq, said, yes, it's true. It's true. And she said, when people used to ask me, what are you? And she's a very pretty girl. What are you? She, she didn't know how to answer that. Who, who am I? What am I? We don't have a nation. We don't have land. So I can't say, I'm from America, or I'm from here, I'm from there. She said, well, we don't have a land. Well, what's that mean? Who are you? What are you? She said, having read your book, now I hold my head high and say, mm. I am an Assyrian. I belong to the prophecy of the future. Wow. Yeah. She doesn't need any more props. And when you find identity in Christ, you really don't need the props anymore. Amen. You don't need uh, what, what somebody thinks of us really. Yeah, it'd be nice if they had nice thoughts, but that really is not, we don't need the prop anymore. If you think I'm an idiot, okay, you think I'm an idiot. I know that I am. I mean, I know that, that I'm not. And uh, so it's, it's in Christ. And, and Many Christians really don't get a handle. They, they, they have become Christians, but they're still reaching to the world for their identity. Mm -hmm. I have to look like this. I have to be like that. I have to like this. And you don't. Right. The Bible is clear. Come out from among them and be separate because there's a day coming when the only thing that's going to be lasting is this eternal family in Jesus Christ. Now, Dr. Ron has been talking to us about the end time days and wants us to prepare for the coming kingdom. And he has written a book titled The Assyrian Prophecy that is a missing part of the end times puzzle. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Write, for these words are true and faithful. The world is not ending. God is preparing a new world soon to begin. An ancient nation thought lost to extinction is soon to rise anew to prepare for that day. Isaiah identified this nation in a prophecy that has been hidden in plain sight for some 2,700 years. Its name is Assyria. My new book, The Assyrian Prophecy, reveals how Assyria will join with Israel and Egypt to bless the world under the soon coming Messiah. Amid today's chaos, God is searching for righteous people through whom he will bring the prophecy to completion. When you reach the end of this book, one question will be in your mind. Lord, what would you have me to do? You can learn more at theassyrianproject.org. We're back, and I'm so glad that you're with us. I don't know where you're, you may be watching. I know that this program is now wrapping around the world, and that's exciting to us. I don't know what state of life you're in, but we have Stacy Watkins with us today, and she's going to be sharing some extraordinary insights that I want you to, I want you to hear. They are significant to you, so stay tuned. Stacy, tell us your story. Okay, so we have been talking about adoption. We've been talking about being chosen. Uh, we have talked about how we get a new identity in Christ when all of that happens. And, and this for you is experiential because you were adopted. Correct. And the amazing thing and the reason why I wanted everyone that watches our telecast to hear you is because you have made the crossover between the fact that we, you were adopted humanly but every single believer on earth is adopted into the family of, of God through Christ. Amen. That was amazing. So please continue. So uh, being adopted, uh, we are now an heir is what the scripture says. 
And I like to look up definitions to, to find out exactly what they mean. It says an inheritance by definition is something not earned. It is endowed to you by a benefactor. So with our spiritual adoption, it's God who's our benefactor. And it's not anything that we have earned because it's all filthy rags is what we have. We don't have anything, but it's because of Jesus. Elaborate on that because someone may say filthy rags because we don't understand. We're born and our family coos and calls all, all over us and we're the most wonderful thing that ever stepped on the planet. And that can fog our understanding of the fact that yeah, but also down deep inside, we are in the filthy rags of sin. We were born that way. We didn't have a choice about that. Right. And, and I want every viewer to understand that because, because we must be delivered from that and cleansed from that through Jesus Christ. So continue. So that's really the only way that we can be yeah. is through Jesus. Uh, he was the perfect sacrifice. Um, one time, once done. And I mean, I think when I was a, a kid, my dad's nickname for me was Big Deal because I always thought that I was a big deal. And I mean, I was in the family, like you said, I was a big deal. I you were a that spark way. plug. Yeah, I felt that way. <laughs> I was, you know, I was a big deal, but it was, you know, definitely not true because of I had a sin nature. I mean, I was treated as a big deal. I was loved, definitely, you know, and God loves you. God loves you even if you don't love him, if you don't return that. He loves you. He wants you to come into a relationship with him because he has so many blessings for us. He has so much in store for us that he wants to share with us and share with you. Um, and one of that is, you know, by having an inheritance. Once you are accepted into the family, and it says in my adoption decree once again that... Um, I have all the rights of a child and heir at law of James and Joan Klein. So what that's stating is I have the same exact rights to be an heir as my sister, who was born naturally to my parents. And now because of what Christ has done, we are now heirs through him, and we are seated with Christ. In the heavenly places, we have, it says, Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He's seated because his work is done. It's finished. It's complete so that we lack nothing in Christ. Uh, Romans 8, 17 says, believers are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. That's just amazing to me that we can be a joint heir with Christ. So we start off separated. From the time that we're born, we're separated from God because of what Adam did. And then through that process, the knowing that God chose you and he will always choose you because he loves you. And when you accept that, then you are adopted. And then now you are a co-heir with Christ. Um, it's just he didn't die just for our salvation, but he died to bring us into right standing with the Heavenly Father, with our Father. It says in Titus 3, 7, having been justified by grace, we have been made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I mean, that's just, it's such a blessing just to know that. And we can walk freely in our inheritance. Like we know we have confident access now to God. We don't have to live in fear. As we said before, that perfect love casts out all fear so we can approach God as a father. So if you don't have a, a natural father that has been good to you, um, unfortunately, there are parents out there that are not good to their kids. But your heavenly father is because he's perfect. He loves you. He has a new identity for you that you don't have to live the way you've been living. Um, and your circumstances might not change in a blink of an eye. You know, like you said, it's not magic. But you will have a peace. You will have a joy. You will have a knowing of who you are in Christ and who the Heavenly Father thinks, and not thinks, but knows, you know, who you are and who he has called you to be. 
Um, the scripture says also, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So we are promised peace. We are promised joy. We are promised love. We are promised acceptance. We are promised provision. We are promised health. It says there are over 7,400 promises in the Bible. And God being a good God cannot go back on those promises. Um, I, I know that sometimes things don't happen in our time frame, um, but that doesn't change who God is and what he has for us. God wants to give all of us good and perfect gifts. Amen. It was the brother of James, or the brother of Jesus, James, who said that. Now, he knew Jesus as a teenager. He knew him in his early 30s. And so he watched him all of his life. And he wrote this little book called The Book of James that is an awesome book. And I think that the book was mainly around that verse, that God gives good and perfect gifts. Mm -hmm. Your mom and your dad wanted nothing but the best for you and your sister, Debbie. That's right. They wanted the best, and they poured their lives out to give you the best. Mm -hmm. The best of what they were as people, best of what they could in education, best of what they could in, in material things. In every way, they wanted you and Debbie, to be abundantly blessed. Now, here's the God of the universe, the creator of all things. And he, he loves to give lavishly. Look at this universe. Amen. He gave us a, a whole universe. We're enjoying riding on his planet, looking at his universe, eating his food, breathing his air. He's a lavish giver. Sometimes he heals people. I mean, he blesses in all kinds of ways. Now, the book of James, interestingly enough, makes that point that God wants to give good and perfect gifts. But a perfect gift does not degenerate you, which means all the scriptures around it in that book are, are really cutting right down, right down the line on us. Your tongue, if your, your tongue is a, a, sets off forest fires, if you sin here, you, why is God so serious about us giving up sin? Well, let me illustrate it. Uh, my wife and I know of two situations where people were hoarders. I mean, literal hoarders, where when you, the one, if you went into his house, you had to walk through a path of boxes. And if you looked in his bedroom, he only slept on half of the bed. The other half was stacked with books and boxes. Wow. Now, this was not some dumb guy. I, I'm not going to tell what he did for a living because somebody might guess who I'm talking about. He was pretty well known, but he was a hoarder. Uh, we have a, another friend who, who died not long ago. And again, there was stuff stacked within two feet of the ceiling. Well, nobody in their right mind would say, Let's buy that person a $10 million mansion. Why? Because the same thing would happen there. We don't recognize that in our hearts is lust and envy and jealousy and anger and bitterness and all kinds of layers of sin. If God gives us good and perfect gifts, what are we going to do with it? That's, and James answers that. He says, You pray. And, ha and want, but you have not because you ask to, to put it on in your lust. You want to use God's gifts for lust. Get rid of the lust and you'll get the gift. God wants to give the good and perfect gift. And so I want to encourage anyone that is watching, please understand, sin is clutter. And sin will take the good gifts of God and distort them and use them for godless purposes. You know that already. God has given you a body. Some of you are wrecking those bodies with drugs, with alcohol, with all kinds of things. My friend, clear the, cu cl the clutter. How do you do that? You confess your sins. 1 John 1, 9 is very clear. If we confess our sins by name, Confess them out loud. God, 
I envy. God, I'm jealous. God, I'm selfish. Everything in life, I want it to go my way. If we confess our sins, now this is not psychology, this is incredible. He, God gets involved. If we confess our sins to him, he, he is willing to forgive us our sins. Now that word forgive is a powerful word. He literally takes the record of our sins out of heaven, nails it to the cross of his son Christ, separates you from your sins as far as the east is from the west, and will bring it to recall no more. He forgives us, and he cleanses us. Ah, uh, my friend, I believe God weeps deeply over you because he wants to give you good and perfect gifts. Would you be willing to get sin out of the way so that he can do that? So that he can give you everything that Stacy's adopted family delightfully gave to her and everything heaven would delightfully give to you? If you're ready for that, I want to say a prayer with you. But think this through. Make this your prayer. Let's pray this together. Dear God, on the basis that Jesus died for me, I'm confessing my sins to you. I want them cleared out of my heart by your forgiveness and by your power. I want to think new thoughts, feel fresh things and clean and pure things. Help me to live obedient to you from now until I meet you in heaven. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glad you were with us today. Stacy. thank you so much for sharing with our friends around the world your story. So powerful, so significant. So good to see you again good after all these you. years. And always remember what the name Emmanuel means. It means God is with you. Well, thanks for being with us today, and we hope you'll join us again next week as we find courage for the journey in our faith walk.